Okay, well, good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon, um, wherever you are in the world. My name is Chris Martin. I am a diploma holder at WSET. Um, I work at WSET. I'm the head of educator training, and I teach levels one, two, three, and for a diploma, I teach uh, fortified wine, in particular, uh, the fortified wines of Portugal. And tonight we're gonna to look at one of those, which is port. Um, so I saw that some of you have been, have a glass of port with you, which is very nice. Um, I've got a nice port here, which I'll talk about uh, later on tonight. Um, so you may see me sipping that. I'm also wearing my festive elf hat, which, you know, we have to keep, we have to keep something happy for uh, 2020. So I'll take you through port, um, a little bit of the history, the region, uh, some of the grapes, go through the different styles. Uh, for some of you, you know, decoding port labels can be slightly confusing. Hopefully by the end of this, it will be a much clearer in terms of what each of these labels mean and the styles that you can expect from them. Then I'll end with a little bit about some of the trends that are happening in port, in terms of the port business, and then talk about some ways in which you can enjoy port. And as always, then we'll have just sort of five or 10 minutes towards the end, sometimes for questions. So if you do have any questions, um, if you were joined uh, before, just after six, Lydia will um, be manning or be in control of the group chat. So please write any of your questions there and I, she will let me know what they are and I will answer them hopefully at the end of the session. So without a further ado, let us jump in to port. So first off, what is port? Well, port is a fortified wine from Portugal. So fortified means that there has been the addition of spirit so that it is over 15% alcohol. And we'll see that port is usually 19 plus percent ABV. And I'll be talking about what that actually means uh, when we go through some of the winemaking um, later this, after, uh, this evening. So the history of port is, is a really interesting one, and it's one that is intricately tied with the relationship between England and Portugal, um, which has for a very long time had um, a connection, um, both politically and economically. In the 17th century, there were um, quite a number of wars and unpleasantries with um, France in particular. And England at the time was a large uh, country or a country that drank a large amount of Bordeaux wines and, and other French wines. With the wars going on, uh, those supply, that supply of wine was cut off. Uh, but the British people, needed their their alcohol they needed their source of wines uh, and so they turned to portugal um, and it was in this time that we started to see a uh, move towards towards portuguese wine um, there were two british uh, missionaries who went to the abbots of um, lamego and they were in that area and they basically discovered that this abbot was sort of creating this fortified wine, which they discovered was of a much higher quality than the, dry, uh, the still wines of, of Port, Portugal. And so they started going, well, this is quite interesting. Let's start importing this and so you are exporting this to to um, the UK and so you started to see at this time the birth of lots of these companies if you look at lots of the names of port houses you will notice that they have quite a English flair shall we say Taylor's for example Graham's Dow and so forth there were other um, companies, obviously, um, Dutch and Portuguese themselves, which were also uh, making their, these sorts of wines. But this really started sort of around this time. 
Um, in 1703, the um, English, uh, the British signed a treaty with the Portuguese, um, the Mathian Treaty. Uh, the key of this was really the lower rate of duty. So they gave the wines of Portugal a, an advantage over the other wines of the world. Um, the British people being a particularly, uh, shall we say, uh, thrifty lot, thought, oh, we can get quite high levels of alcohol in our wine at relatively cheap prices. Port is the place to go. And there really was, after that, in the se early 1700s, a massive expansion of ports, fortified ports, from Portugal going to the UK. As a result of this sort of massive demand, these lower taxes, there were a number of producers who were producing, shall we say, less than high quality wines. Uh, and as a result of that, potentially doing some damage to the, the Portuguese uh, and the ports uh, wine industry. So as a result of this, this, this lower quality, uh, in 1756, a, a chap um, who was the Marquis de Pombal uh, said, right, what we need to do is we're going to start making some rules about how to make port, what goes into it, uh, where you can make it, certain laws and regulations. It is debatable. Um, from a historical point of view, whether this was the first sort of, um, you know, IGP or um, a PGI that sort of came into existence, PDO rather, which is protected de designation of origin. Um, but this is this sort of idea where you see AC in France or um, the other sort of DO in, in Spain and so on. Um, the other country that, that sort of claims it was the first was uh, Hungary in Tokai. But in any case, in 1756, the Marquis de Pombal said, right, we're going to make some rules. Port has to have these particular things. And as a result of that, uh, the quality re recovered um, and, and sort of went back into a more higher level uh, quality uh, range. Born from this idea, there were a number of regulatory bodies that came about in the uh, 19th um, and early 20th century, which started to organize and sort of control more about the types of uh, vineyards where the port was being, or the grapes were being grown, but also um, how much you could sell. Uh, what you could sell, the percentage of alcohol, where you had to buy the fortifying liquid that goes into it. There were a number of these particular things. When Portugal joined the EU in 1986, a number of those things were found to violate EU regulations, um, and, and in particular the sort of uh, non-competition uh, clauses and so forth. And they were essentially giving... Um, monopolies to, to certain companies. Uh, so the, lots of those were just, uh, torn apart. And then the, the Institute of Wine um, for Duro and Ports, um, the IVDP, um, was created. This, this building here is a picture I took of it when I was, was there a few years ago. Uh, and the IVDP, since 2003, governed the, the, the production of ports, selling ports, um, and we'll talk about them as we go through um, the, the presentation um, today. So this is sort of just putting it a little bit into perspective um, about port. So where is, where are we exactly? So here we are in Portugal. Here is Porto, the city itself, o Porto in Portuguese. Um, we're 41, so we're just, um, this is the Atlantic over here. So we're getting lots of Atlantic influences um, and lots of cooling influences along here. It is very rainy in um, Oporto. It's, it's similar type climate to uh, Manchester in terms of the amount of rain. So Manchester, the UK, um, in terms of the amount of rain per year. Very, very rainy. 
However, if you go along the River Douro, along here, um, and then you come into the Douro itself. So there we've got these mountains here. So I'll show you some pictures of the sort of stunning um, vistas that you have here. This is where we have the production area of port. So in this area, this is where the port is, is being made. This is where the grapes are being grown. And what happens is then, um, and I'll talk about these particular ones, but essentially they, they, they start their life, a bottle of port will start its life out here. In the old, old days, it would travel down the river and then end up here at Villanova de Gaia, which is the city right opposite Porto. There's a lovely bridge that connects the two. Um, where it would spend its life and mature until it was bottled and eventually um, sold. And we'll, we'll sort of track the life of, of a port as we go through it. So um, in the, the Douro Valley, which is this area here, you have a very, very warm climate. Um, and it's relatively dry climate as well. So as you're going from as you're going sort of further and further east, the climate becomes warmer and warmer, and the influences of the Atlantic become less and less um, as you go further over. So in here, in the Baixo Corgo, um, you have about 900 milliliters of rain um, per year. In Cima Corgo, uh, you have about 750, and in Douro Superior Ore, you have around 440 milliliters per year. So the rain becomes less. You have, so this is the very wet area. This is the sort of moderate one, and this is incredibly dry. Because this is protected by these mountains range here, it is a continental climate. So in summer, we're getting really hot, 40 degrees, plus um, that is 40 degrees Celsius. Um, I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit, um, but I imagine it's something in the 2000s or something. I don't know, I don't understand Fahrenheit. In any case, um, this is, it gets very warm. Um, and then obviously in winter, it gets very, very cold. So it does actually freeze. As a result of this, spring frosts can be an issue with some of the grape varieties um, that are grown there. Because Baixo Corgo is the wettest, um, it, it's got lots of disease pressure there. Um, Douro Superior, because it's the driest, there's lots of drought pressure there. So Cima Corgo is sort of the happy in-between of, of these um, area. Um, and if we go, sorry, uh, if we go here, we sort of zoom in, you can see here how hilly the area really is. So this is um, Quinta no, uh, de Naval um, in Pino, which is just here in the center of Cima Corgo, um, just sort of a bit up here in the mountains. You've got this altitude and the altitude obviously is adding a cooling influence, but not only is it a cooling influence, as you can see here from this morning mist, um, we're above the fog line in some cases. So here, there's still some fog here, but what this picture belies is that there's actually this slope goes up and up and up um, here. And those are very much above um, the, the fog line there. So the sunlight, you're getting lots of sun. The direction, you can see here how sort of in this distance, how hilly and circular it is. Um, so even in one sort of, and we'll talk about these terraces in a moment, even within one of these, you're getting lots of sun on one part and you turn the corner and there's no sun. So um, planting when we get to grapes is, is important in this case. So this, this is a very sort of typical view. There's, there's a uh, Kinta down here. Um, so Kinta, when I say this, this is the, the farms essentially that are growing uh, the grapes. So these are all the grapes along here. So uh, let us move on. So as I said with these slopes, um, the issue with the slopes is, well, how are we going to grow the grapes there? 
So the soil itself in here, you can see um, perhaps um, if you've zoomed in, the sort of rocky nature of, of the, the, slope, uh, the slopes here, especially here, and in, in this case, um, there is granite soils, which are very, very hard and, excuse me, very difficult for the plants to grow on. You then have schist, which is much easier for the grapes and the vine, the roots to go down. So planting densities can, can vary by site. But obviously then what you have to think is once you've identified, okay, here's the soil that I need, uh, then you think, okay, well, how the heck am I going to grow grapes on this very, very, very steep slope? And this historical way of creating terraces was started way, 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 way back when. So what they did in the first case here were these brick or stone walls that you can see here, hopefully on my, with my laser pointer. Um, and, and to go between them, there's here, these are the steps that go between these terraces. Um, these are now protected by um, the UNESCO, um, which is the World Heritage Site. So if anything were to happen to any of these, they can't be destroyed, they have to be repaired. Now, you can imagine that as you see here, um, in this case, we are very far away from Porto. This area is relatively rural. And as is the case, not only in Portugal, but around the world, there is an urbanization that's happening. So labor that would have been easily available 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 years ago have moved out of this area. So the upkeep of these walls are incredibly expensive. And because they are protected as a World Heritage Site, they have to be constantly preserved. So some of the sites that they, they have them, these producers, if they own them going, this is too much and they're selling, there's lots of this selling off to larger grape growers, larger producers, so that they're able to, to preserve um, these very beautiful and historic terraces. You see here, there's about two rows of vines. Um, in this case, there's three and then there's two down here and then it goes to one. Uh, they are relatively compact. You can get about 6,000 vines per hectare. But as you can imagine, sort of mechanizing this is particularly challenging. So there's, it requires a lot of labor, which is expensive and difficult to come by. So they created another system, um, which is similar to this. But essentially, they would just take the stones that were lying about and sort of make these terraces like this, which you can see even here in the distance. And this bit here, if you see that, that's a road that cuts through those so that they're able to access them with small tractors and with these sort of large rubbery things. Uh, so that there's, it cuts down on the amount of labor that's required. So you'll see a move um, with newer sites and some of the other sites that don't have these um, to this type of trellising. You'll also see this type of trellising, which is used more in the Douro Superior. Uh, this one is when it's particularly sort of um, steep. And as you can see, they, 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 they essentially are coming down the hill rather than across the hill like that. And if you ever get the chance um, after this disastrous nonsense about this virus to go traveling. I highly recommend the drawer. It's beautiful when you, if you come along the train, um, you can take a train from Porto to Pinau. It takes a long time. You can also drive there. But if you take the train, you go along the river and, and once you go through it, it is, it is absolutely um, a sight to behold. So I just want to talk a little bit about the grape varieties that we see in Porto um, and in the Douro. There are over a hundred grape varieties that are grown here. Uh, lots of them are unique to the Douro Valley. Some of them are unique to uh, this area. Some of them, as we'll see, uh, 
are common um, around, around the world. Though there are a massive number of them, there are a particular handful, these, these five here, that are used the most common in blends. So these are the ones that you will see in, in red uh, ports, and we'll talk a little bit about white ports. Uh, some of you may not know that white, that port does make white ports, uh, and it is absolutely delicious port, and we'll talk a bit about that. This, by the way, is not a white port. So, uh, Taruga Franca, is uh, the workhorse essentially of Porto and, and the Douro Valley. It is late ripening, it needs heat to ripen, so you will see it on the hottest sites, which is really convenient because the majority of sites in the Douro Valley are particularly hot. So you're going to see this in Cima Corco a lot uh, in terms of its planting. It is incredibly vigorous, so it produces a lot. It adds color, it adds tannin, it adds acidity to grape, uh, to the blends. So we are, it, it really is adding all of those components that we need for high quality ports. By the way, for, I know that there were a few people um, from Brazil, and I imagine some from Portugal as well, I apologize in advance for the butchering of your marvelous language. Um, but here we have Tinta Jorges, which is also known as Tempranillo, which you may know from Rioja in Spain. Here, this is adding body and color. This is a relatively early ripening grape variety, and so therefore needs a slightly cooler site. So you'll see this on the really high, high altitudes um, parts of a of the of planting. Then you have uh, Tinta Barocca. Uh, again, this is early ripening, so you need the cool sites. What the cool sites do is they slow down the ripening process, so that the grapes are able to develop flavour and concentration, and not just develop sugars and then no flavours uh, to them. Again, this one, because it's so early ripening, it needs the cooler sites. And so you'll often see this one in um, Baixo Corgo. Uh, here, it doesn't really add much of the floral flavors to, to a wine. Here, you're gonna add lots of the earthy flavors, sort of the more meaty um, flavors. It's relatively lower in acidity, but the advantage is it's high yielding. So if you have a site that is particularly low, sorry, um, high in altitude or particularly cool, this is, this is your go-to grape. Taruga Nacional, some of you may have wondered, why have I not, why did I not start with Taruga Nacional? Well, Taruga Franca is, these are the sort of in order of um, the percentage of plantings. And Taruga Nacional is, is actually relatively low in terms of um, hectares in which it's planted. But Taruga Nacional is the grape that people think of when they think of port. It has high acidity, it has high tannins, it has well pronounced deep uh, flavors of blackberry, cassis, uh, black plum, lots of these black fruits flavors. It is incredibly thick skin, so it's also adding color to the wine. This is the, one, uh, this is the grape that you're going to see in the majority of vintage uh, ports, or in very high-end ports like that. And indeed, the Nacional um, name itself is also the name of Quinta de Naval, which is the wine I'm, I'm not drinking a Nacional, I wish I were, um, of, their, of their single Quinta uh, vintage, which I'll talk about uh, shortly. You have um, Tinta Chau. Um, this is a relatively low yielding, late ripening um, grape variety, but with high levels of acidity. So when a, when a port producer is looking at making a blend uh, or making a port, 
lots of the choices they're thinking about is, okay, where are these grapes coming from? What are they adding? Do I want to make a more floral style, a more earthy style? Do I want acidity for longevity? Do I want something lower acidity for more easy drinking, early release? These are the decisions they, they're taking into account. Again, there are a number of white uh, grape varieties. The two uh, most important ones here are Malvasia fina. Uh, also, this is the grape variety that's confusingly uh, also found in another part of Portugal, the island of Madeira in the style of Madeira called the Boal. Not, not, in, Malva not in the Malvasia style of Madeira. That's, a, that's, a, that's another uh, discovering uh, workshop we can do. Uh, but this, this one here is, is medium acid, uh, full bodied. It has a slightly honeyed honeycomb note to it. Uh, it. It's a really lovely, lovely type of wine. Then we have this Muscatel, which I'm not even going to try to butcher the name of, but this is uh, Muscat Muscatel um, uh, Blanca Petit Grand, which is the one that you will find in other types of Muscat, uh, Muscat Bon de Venise. Uh, very aromatic. Uh, grape variety. Again, you'll find these and many others uh, around around the, the production uh, or grown in the area, rather. So, when when people think of port, uh, I think the thing that comes to mind, the image that comes to mind, is the image of all the sort of local children, uh, maybe some of the some of the younger teenagers, um, some of the young ladies in sort of shorts stomping on grapes. Um, and that's the image that we have of sort of this big festival of everyone ch chopping, stomping on the grapes. Uh, and that does happen up to a certain extent. Um, but what I want to talk about is Unfortunately, alas, I don't have a picture of that marvelous event, but I do have the, the sort of picture of where this happens in the sort of more modern version. So when fortification happens with, with anything, but with port in particular, what we're doing is we're interrupting the fermentation. So the fermentation, the yeast is slowly eating the sugars and producing alcohol. At a certain point, we want to add uh, the fortifying liquid, so we stop that, therefore doing a number of things. We are increasing the alcohol, not through any fer fermentation process, but rather through this addition of, of fortifying liquid. And what we're also doing here is we're allowing there to be some residual sugar left over because there's sugar that the yeasts are unable to eat because we've essentially killed them with this uh, fortifying liquid. What happens during fermentation for red wine is a number of very complicated things, but what's, what's happening is an extraction of flavor and an extraction of color. So if you actually stop the fermentation, the color could be not as deep as we want it, or it could not, it, we might not be getting the aromatics that we want um, from the wine. So in order to maximize this extraction of aromatic flavors um, and tannins, which are important in certain vintages, uh, as well as, as all of these, as well as color, what they do is they did this, this trodding of the grapes. Uh, and this was done in um, this thing called the, the Lagarish. And this is, this is one here that's made of granite. And what would happen is, historically, they would do something, this is, this is made of granite. And the, you can't see, but um, in, in the, in, inside here, this is not a smooth granite, it's a, it's a rough granite. So the grapes, as they're being stomped upon, are hitting and abrasing against the, the, the granite here and cracking open. The skin and the juice, is, the juice is coming out of the skin, and that then starts this extraction process. The human foot is a very gentle thing. And so stomping up and down on it breaks the skin 
against this granite's um, surface here, but is not breaking the seeds of the grape. And those, that's important because the seeds of those grapes have very, 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 very bitter compounds that are undesirable in any finished wine. So the stomping of the, the grapes had this purpose of starting this extractive process before any fermentation happened, so that when the fortification happened, there was a maximization of color, tannins, um, and aroma. As I mentioned, people are leaving the Dura Valley, so the number of people available, or the number of feet, shall we say, that are available have decreased. So lots of producers are resulting, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, um, just this is the nature of it, to these robotic ones. And this is what you see here. So this is also, this, um, this is Quinta de Naval as well. In fact, this is, for those of you who are interested, this is indeed the exact Lagares where they make their national. These pistons here um, have on the bottom this sort of round rubber foot. And what happens is you can see that this metal bit here, this basically goes up and down and up and down. And these pistons imitate the stomping of the grapes. So the grapes will come in through, uh, where's my mouse, through the doors here. They'll be dumped into this vat, and then this will start pressing them down, starting that extractive process. This is a very fancy piece of kit in this case, uh, but this is a sort of version that other producers use in different formats, and other producers have pre created different versions of these robotic ones in this case. You then at about five to seven percent, uh, once once the, once it starts fermenting, about when it's about five or seven percent ABV, so very low alcohol strength. So there's quite a lot of sugar left over. We fortify the wine by adding a a, a type of spirit, a grape spirit called aguardente, which is seventy seven percent ABV. Now, you may think 77%, my goodness, that's very strong. But in the world of spirits, a distilled spirit at 77% is actually what we call a low strength spirit. And low strength spirits are very pronounced in flavor. Uh, for example, if you had a cognac, this is an aside, a cognac versus a vodka. So those are two different strengths. A cognac's coming off at about 75 to 80% ABV. Uh, when it goes into barrel, obviously then it's diluted, but a vodka is at 95 to 96 percent, which as you, which is then diluted down to 40 percent. So you can imagine that what they're adding here is more the sort of cognac brandy style rather than the vodka style that you would see in other um, styles or other categories of fortified wines. So it's what's important with this step of fortification is the quality of that aguardente. If it is very low quality, then that's going to impact the style of the wine. If it's high quality aguardente, then it's going to obviously, because you're gonna be able to taste it. Because, the, because we are fortifying it at five to seven percent, and we are producing a spirit that's between 18 to 20 percent, well, really 19 to 21 percent ABV, what this roughly means is that for every one liter of spirit, you need four liters of must, of wine must. So in a bottle, it's nearly around 20 odd percent of a bottle of port. Here's a bottle of port. Quite a chunk of it is spirit. So the quality of that is very important. So in any case, uh, the, the wine, it goes in here, we are fortifying it, um, then we, we take it off um, and we'll stick it into, depending on 
what the producer, the style that the producer wants to make from that particular um, uh, wine, they'll stick it into the into some barrels, so either small barrels or large barrels. Uh, this is one of my favorite expressions, I think, um, which is that the wine overwinters in the Douro Valley. Uh, because the Douro is quite cold, as we said, in winter, it spends the winter there or overwinters. Um, there, I would like to overwinter in the Caribbean, but uh, alas, that's not possible. But in any case, they stay there. And then what happens is they then will travel to Villanova de Gaia, where they will continue their maturation. And that starts in the spring of the following year. So the key to fortified wines is in the process in which it's, matur in, in which it's matured. So what I want to do next is slightly is, is to walk through the different styles of ports that we have um, in in uh, in Porto. Um, so essentially, we have two two broad styles here. Ruby styles are more in a sort of red ruby style and tawny is a slightly more oxidative sort of more brown tawny style and i'll go through each of these um, and highlight some of the some of the main points as we go through these are roughly in order of quality level so the basic or starter or entry level is our ruby port here um, these ruby ports are generally going to be made in a very sort of easy to drink style. So the, the tannins um, will probably be more towards the medium. We're not going to be using our high quality grapes in this case. Very little, if any, Taruga Nacional is going to be going in here. We'll probably have some um, Taruga Flanca um, or Tinta Jorges, depending obviously on what we want. The idea here is protective winemaking, you know, maybe two, two, three years, and then it, it goes out to market. And, and they're very sort of uh, affordable, easy to drink um, expressions of them. If we leave them a little bit longer in the barrel, uh, there is no minimum for the ruby reserve but if we want to leave it in there for maybe four or five years uh maybe introduce some notion some, some light oxidative character in there uh it gets a bit more depth of character slightly turned up in terms of uh the the tannins the acidity and so forth then this is released as a ruby reserve Again, each of, the, each of the different port importers and exporters will have their own different ways of making this. They'll have their own blends. There are certain rules and regulations about how much port can be sold in a year. And I'll talk a bit about that as we go through. Important though to note that these two styles, um, Ruby and Ruby Reserve, are non-vintage products. So this means that it is a blend of different years. The idea of that is that there is a consistency of brand. When you go and you buy your Coburn's uh, Ruby Reserve or you go and buy your Grimm's uh, Six Grapes, it always should always roughly be the same quality year in, year out. The first vintage character that we have is late bottle vintage. This was created um, as a sort of marketing ploy because people see a vintage and they think, oh, vintage, that must mean good. All it means is that it is from that single year. It has to spend four to six years in, in woods. Um, it generally avoids oxidation. There might be some oxidative elements to it. It has got sort of medium plus, um, so sort of, you know, relatively not super high, but medium plus tannins, medium plus acidity, uh, fairly pronounced, but we're not sort of in the land of, of really sort of overly aromatic um, or complex in that case. 
You can get some LBVs uh, that are bottles, unfined and unfiltered. This is a sort of trends. Uh, the idea being that then it will evolve a little bit and, and develop a little bit in bottle. These lack the concentration um, and depth that you will find in a vintage port. However, they are still from a particular single year. You can also find that some of these are then uh, aged in bottle for a bit before they're released. But generally, when you get a ruby, a ruby reserve, or an LBV, those are meant for sort of, they have done the aging, you don't need to age it for it, go, go, go forth and, and drink. Crusted port um, is again a non-vintage port. It spent a maximum of two years in wood, so not quite as much as LBV. And here it's, it's sort of, it nearly made it to vintage, but wasn't quite good enough, but was a little bit better than LBV. But maybe we need to sort of put a little blending to it. This is unfiltered and unfined. So when you unfilter a wine before you bottle it, or when you find it, a wine before you bottle it, essentially what you're doing is you're removing all the solid bits. So you may have got a wine, a red wine that has got sort of some sediment to it. Uh, that is because it hasn't been as fine as, as some of the other wines. This crusted port, when you, when you, when you drink it, it's what it calls as throws a crust, which is that sort of thick red line of, of sort of tannins and anthocyanines and all that delicious yummy stuff. So this you can bottle age uh, for a bit. Um, vintage, I'm just going to skip over a single kinter here. Vintage is the pinnacle of the pinnacle. This is your top grapes. This is mostly going to be, not always, but it's going to be very heavy on Turuga Nacional, the grape variety that's super, everything is turned up to 11 in terms of acids in terms of tannins, um, in terms of flavor um, and concentration. You might get some um, Taruga Franca in there as well. But essentially, you've got this wine, and after about two, well, after two years after harvest, the, you have to then decide, is this wine going to become a vintage wine? And you have to then declare it with the IVDP and say, Mr. and Mrs. IVDP, this barrel or these barrels are going to become our vintage. We want to declare this year as a vintage year. So you will find some producers in some years, for example, 2011 and 2016, nearly every single producer um, declared a vintage. Um, they went, yep, we're going to do it. In some other years, for example, 2015, some of the producers said, uh, we don't really have a vintage product. Some of them said, oh yeah, we've got a vintage product, we're going to declare one. So the reason why they would or would not declare a vintage port is partly is the quality of the wine good enough, but also is there lots of vintage port already on the market? If there's lots of vintage port already in the market because you just launched one the year before, is it good business to suddenly say, oh, we've got a better one this year? Uh, so again, it's, it's one of those ones where not everyone declares, um, but some producers um, do, do declare quite a lot. But again, there's lots of factors that go into it. These are the ones that then spend um, three years maximum in wood. They are then bottled um, and they are aged in bottle. So in bottle, they then start to develop lots of tertiary and complex flavors. Ruby, Ruby Reserve, LBV, um, crusted up to a point, but these ones are not really meant for long bottle aging. They have done the aging for you. If you have those ones sitting in, in your, your storeroom, best open them up. Uh, I mean, I think best open up anything nowadays, it's 2020. Um, single Kinta is a vintage port, essentially, that comes from a single Kinta, but perhaps may not be good enough to become a vintage. 
um, but it still has a depth of flavor to it. The reason why they may decide to say it's a single Kinter or a vintage um, depends uh, on, the, on the quality, it depends on the producer, it depends on market demands. Tawny styles of ports are slightly more tawny in color, so that's a slightly browny, ambery color. And again, we have tawny, we have tawny reserve, um, we, have some, we have some other ones here. So tawny, your, your sort of bog standards um, tawny um, is no older than some of these ruby styles that we have up here. Um, how they've been made is perhaps with a slightly lighter uh, extraction. So they, maybe the grape did, weren't able to extract that much color to it. So it was a bit lighter in color. Um, and this is where then you get this, this tawny one. Tawny Reserve, this is uh, six years in oak. Um, again, these are, these are blended. Um, and again, it's gonna perhaps start having some oxidative notes to it. So you're gonna start getting some coffee um, notes to it as well. Tawny with an indication of age, so this is your 10-year-old, 20-year-old, 30-year-old, or 40-year-old. Um, I am having, if you can see that, a 20-year-old um, Naval, um, which is a Tawny. This is not, if you're a whiskey drinker, it's, it, the rules are quite different. This is not the youngest uh, ports in there. This is an indication of style. So what does a 10 year old port taste like? Well, a 10 year old tawny port tastes like what the IVDP say a 10 year old tawny port should taste like. Essentially, you as a port producer create your port. Uh, you say this tastes like a 10 year old tawny. You go to the IVDP and say, I think this is what it tastes like. They go, huzzah, that's what it is. Uh, and then you can sell it. Or they go, no, this isn't a 10 year old tawny. You need to go in and tinker with the blend again. So again, that's 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, these have a, are essentially blends of um, Coyeta. And these, you can think of a Coyeta as a sort of vintage tawny port. So if you remember at two years, so we, we put this wine into a barrel at two years, the wine, the, the, the producer says, this is gonna be a vintage, this is gonna not be a vintage. If it's not gonna be a vintage, it continues its life in barrel. Um, and then it could be at, at around four or six years, it says, okay, now, now we're gonna make a decision, are we gonna make an LBV from it? Uh, perhaps the color is, is a little bit off. Perhaps they might say, no, we're going to make a tawny reserve. Or they say, no, we're just going to leave this in barrel for a really, really, really long time. Um, and this is then when you get this single vintage Coyeta. They are a minimum of seven years old. Um, and essentially, they are just sitting in barrel aging. So there's lots of oxidation that's happening. There's lots of um, yeah, this process of going in and out of the wood and concentration of lots of things. To give you an indication, here is a port tasting that I did. Um, this was a 2018, so that was the year in which I went, white port. This was a 2007 port. This was a 2007 blended 10-year-old port. And this port, if you can see the date there, was 1940. That port is white, even though it is fairly dark in color. Um, so that's just an indication of what happens to white ports. So you can imagine a similar sort of process happening, um, though with a slightly different color gradation to, to um, red ports. When a Coyeta is bottled, you need to have two dates on it. You need to have the date of the vintage and the date it was bottled. If you have a Coyeta at home, the aging, or if you have a tawny with an indication of age, the aging has already been done for you. You know, this wine, 20 year old tawny port, is meant for drinking now. If I age this for 10 years, I do not have a 30 year old tawny port. What I have is a 10 year old, 20 year old tawny port, um, which is not going to be as nice as it is right now. 
So really, with the exception of sort of perhaps crusted single kinta and vintage, ports is meant for when you buy it, you drink it. It's not meant for additional aging because it's not going to get better in bottle. It's not going to get perhaps worse, but it's not going to, it's not going to improve. So, you know, if you've spent the money on a nice 30 or 40 year old um, tawny, go for it, drink it, why not? So um, I am just suddenly aware of the time. I just want to speed through a little bit of some of the port, uh, port, port trends um, and then just end with some of the fun ways of, in which we can enjoy uh, port. One of the big trends um, is port and, uh, well, port as it, it, it being used in cocktails. Port has attempted to reposition itself slightly as opposed to sitting on a wine shelf where 20% when it's sitting next to perhaps a muscadet um, at you know 12% and at now 20% for port appears really high alcohol, they're repositioning themselves on the spirit aisle where when you're sitting next to a gin, which is at maybe 40, 42%, suddenly 20% is a light uh, drink. So using it in cocktails um, counterintuitively is appealing to that lower alcohol trends that we're seeing um, in, in, in the booze industry. One of the, the cocktails, which uh, if, you, if you joined when I was chatting to Lydia earlier, is port and tonic. White port and tonic uh, is a wonderful uh, drink in summer on, or on any day. Um, Fever Tree, which is one of the large uh, producers of tonic, um, made a sort of a partnership with Coburn's Fine Tawny, uh, Fine White rather, uh, and, and in the UK we're sort of selling the two side by side as a lighter alternative to gin and tonic. And I have to say it's really quite, quite scrumptious. Pink port is, a, 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 or rosé port, is a style of port that Crofts sort of created um, in, the, in the 2000s. You'll see it in a white bottle. It's very pink. It's essentially tawny port, um, it's a, or ruby port that has had very little extraction, but now is marketed in a way for, ooh, rosé. We all love rosé. Different size bottles. Um, so down here, you will see a normal bottle of, um, of port. And up here, you will see a rather ridiculous bottle of port. Unfortunately, I wish I could have had the two side by side. This bottle fits six of these inside it. This is theater. You know, um, Grimm's did this. Um, I don't know if you can see this date here on your computer, but this is a 1982 which um, for the royalists um, who are joining us um, was the year I believe William, yeah, William was born. They released this for, um, they released the 1982 Coyeta for his wedding with um, Kate. And then William, uh, the, the brother Harry, liked it so much that when Harry met, got married to um, Meghan, they re-released it. So this is a wonderful case of here. This is a Coyeta from 1982. But if you had that 1982 in 2012, and then you had it in whenever they got married, what was it, 2017 or something, even though it's the same vintage, the same year, it's a different bottling date, it tasted differently. Um, and these big bottles, uh, you know, they're, you, if you go to a restaurant and someone orders a glass of port and so, this massive bottle comes out and it, it's, it's poured, there's a sense of theatre to it, and, and more people then start um, buying it. Seasonal gifts, um, obviously port is, this is the season for port. Um, and vintage port, you know, that, that is, it still continues to be probably to a lesser degree of, among a certain class of people. Sort of the, the gift you, you buy a case of for your, um, you know, your daughter or your son for when they turn you know, 18, 19, 20, or whenever they leave the house and you can celebrate um, or give it to them. So anyway, um, port for the holiday season. Um, again, as I said, port and tonic, why not start the way with that? Um, with white tonic, uh, I, would, I would go for a slightly more sweeter style of white um, tonic. I'm sorry, of white port. Um, so um, 
Coburn's um, Kids of the Naval do a nice one. Um, Taylor's Dry Ports, I, I, to me, it, it doesn't have quite, the, the, it doesn't work so well um, for the tonic, but to each their own. Obviously, Stilton is the classic comparis, compar, um, pairing, but, you know, I think a 10-year-old goes really nicely with some Comte cheese, 20 year old with some parmesan and manchego, a bit more sort of oomph to it. Um, and I had this in the restaurants, uh, I can't remember, I can't recall where, somewhere in the States, where it's a 40 year old with grilled mango and coconut ice cream. It's, it's oddly specific, I know, but if you ever get the chance, highly recommend it, absolutely scrumptious. Tony ports, um, generally I would serve slightly chilled. Um, I think port is often, the temperature of it's slightly over um, warm, which just ex ex exacerbates the, the alcohol. Obviously, you can have it with dessert. Um, cooking with port, um, I, I, I don't mean having a glass while you're cooking. I mean, obviously, you know, it is the season. But I, I here, it, it's actually adding it um, as a sort of way of deglazing. If you cook, um, you know, soups, adding a bit of sort of white port or some of the tawny ports, just sort of liven it in a way uh, that perhaps just cooking with a regular cheap white or red wine uh, don't do. Experiment, try, try something new, um, or just enjoy a glass. Anyway, uh, I hope that that has been uh, useful and enjoyable. Um, we have sort of sped through the world of ports. Um, hopefully I've disentangled some of it for you. Uh, I realize that there's only two minutes left which is a clever, cunning ploy of mine, not at all. It's just I have bad time management. Um, so Lydia, if you want to ask me any of the questions that were asked or what we want to do. Hello, Chris. Thank you so much for that. Um, sorry, I was just rapidly typing away, answering um, some of the questions. So I pretty, I think I managed to get through most of them on the chat. But equally, if anyone has any further questions, then please, please do feel to pop to pop them in now. I'm, I think I managed to to get to both all of them while you were while you were talking. So thank you so much for for that, Chris. There's lots of thank yous coming through now. So thank you so yeah, much. Yes, yeah, you're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. <laughs> and I'm so impressed that your elf hat managed to stay in position. I know, well, I know at one point I was going to rip it off, but I thought, you know, I might send the wrong message. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you for that. And yes, the recording will be, if anyone missed anything and wants to catch up, the recording will be uh, available on our YouTube channel.